Well, thanks everybody for being here. It's always a pleasure to come to, to Poland. I came here pretty often and uh, I love it. It's cold, but I also like cold weather. And um, as um, it's been said, my name is Enrique Lopez Mañas. If you cannot pronounce it, it's okay. Um, and I'm a part, part of the Google Developer Expert Crew and an IT consultor. Before I actually start, I want to point out something. When I was 18 years old, I used to go out and drink maybe 10 beers, and then uh, I went back home and everything was okay. Now I'm 32, I go, I drink 10 beers, and my head is hurting a lot. So I think that's the global warming. Nobody's doing anything about that. Well, today I want to talk about Android high performance, which is uh, lately a hot topic in the Android development. This is my ego slide. I'm originally from Madrid, but I live in Munich, in Germany. This is my Twitter ID, if you want to follow me there. I generally try to interact with the community. I will post later the, uh, the slides, and if you have any question regarding Android uh, high performance or Android development, just feel, feel free to ask. And how everything started? Well, a year ago, Pack Publishing contacted me and told me, well, would you be interested in uh, writing a book about Android high performance? I said yes, because I think by default, you should always say yes and then try to solve the problems rather than you know, think a lot about that. And um, well, I didn't, at the moment, at that moment, I, I used to work with, uh, with Android development. I've been doing that for the last, uh, since 2008 now. And, um, but well, I was never really focused into high performance. What is a high performance software? What that really means? Uh, which techniques do you have to apply? So I had to start testing my knowledge as well. And um, well, uh, for me, it was an entire process of uh, should we use this type of uh, variables? Should we use enums, static classes? I, I do, did a lot of work of creating my files, compiling them, decompiling them, watching exactly the size they had, etc. So it's been, it's been a journey for me. What is performance? Well, performance is defined as how well a person, a machine, does a piece of work or an activity. This is actually the Cambridge Dictionary definition. But when we talk about high performance, and more particularly about software, we're talking about the strategies to create efficient software. Software that is uh, it's, uh, going th uh, trying to get the last milliseconds, software that is using the memory wisely, etc. Particularly when we talk about devices, we, we want to know about the, the energy and battery consumption. We want to make this very, very efficient. It's also about programming patterns. When we are developing software, we want to make software that lasts, not software that needs to be rewritten every year because uh, we didn't use the, the right paradigms of programming. It's about layouting. We have our screens and we want to create a a very efficient uh, structure, a very efficient hierarchy, so the, the screens are, are being rendered in real time and there is no perception of delay for the user. It's about security. We want to store our data safely. We don't want that anybody can enter and take our tokens or take our user information. It's about multi-threading, uh, especially if I have... Just one question, how many people here develop for Android? I guess most of you? Okay. I, I was expecting something like that. So yeah, well, you know, in Android you have this thing of the UI thread, you have the background threads, uh, you need to communicate the UI with the background operations, so you need to adopt an efficient strategy here. It's also about debugging techniques. When we are debugging our software, we have a lot of tools that not many people actually know in detail, and, uh, um, and Google really provides us a lot of, uh, of uh, help here. Well, why it is important? Um, we want to keep user engagement. That means the user is going to be using our software and not the software of another competitors and another companies. We want to keep costs low. Developing software is very expensive. And uh, if we don't adopt a nice strategy, the cost will skyrocket and we will be out of business. We want to maintain it. We want that new people will come to our company and they, they will be able to work on the projects we've been working. And above all, we want to see quality software. There are a lot of, um, we, can, we can actually, if we don't apply those techniques, we can have financial losses. I like, when I talk with a manager, I'm a developer myself, 
I always like to mention the financial aspect because a manager doesn't care about many things. But when you mention money, when you mention dollars or euros or slotties, they start understanding that this is important. And we can have a financial loss from lost business. That means when the user is not uh, using our application because it's not being performant, we can have a financial loss from uh, customer reparations. If you remember the case of um, uh, Sony, for example, they had a lot of problems where um, people were entering into the PlayStation network, um, stealing data, selling this data later, or uploading passwords. So um, you need to pay those users a compensation because you are uh, causing them some damage. You can have a financial loss from lost customers, a customer that was previously using your software and then quits. Lawsuits, you know, the, the lawyers, this is, uh, 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 these people that pretty much try to get money from your mistakes, they, they will use the opportunity of uh, suing you if you're um, making any mistake. And uh, of course, if the quality is not good, you will have a lower brand uh, equity for your company and you want to avoid all those things. When it came into software responsiveness, we have three important limits. The first one is 0.1 seconds. This is the limit for the user to feel that the system is reacting instantly. There is no special feedback that needs to be provided. If everything is under 0.1, everything will be fine. One second is the time when the user, the thought uh, change of the user starts, starts being interrupted. He starts perceiving a delay and uh, things can start getting nasty. And 10 seconds is the limit for keeping the user attention. More than 10 seconds, the user will likely quit the application and start doing another thing, and that's the, the thing that um, will prevent you of having a, a nice user experience. This is actually a very nice study. You have here the authors, Miller and Card. It's a, it's a really old paper where they, um, they uh, well, made a lot of study with people using um, computer software and analyzing how they were uh, getting distracted or keeping using the software or not. And uh, if, if you have some time, I strongly recommend you to Google and download the paper. What this means in Android? Well, of course, A and R. What does A and R means? Very good. So is this a nasty screen that came and says that something is not responding? And uh, if you want to close it, you close it and the application is gone. This gets triggered if there is no uh, response for an input event in five seconds. That means you click on the screen and nothing is happening uh, after five seconds. Android, the operative system, will trigger this screen. And also, if a broadcast receiver is still executing after 10 seconds without providing any feedback. How can we avoid it? Well, if you have a background operation, you should show some feedback. We have the progress bar. We have uh, the linear one and also the one that is spinning. This is a must or uh, this kind of feedback should be shown anytime there is a, a background operation that is, uh, we don't have certainty of the time that it will take to, to finish. We have more techniques. Uh, uh, I know some people don't like uh, splash screens, but uh, splash screens can also be very beautifully done. If you know uh, Cyril Motier, um, he wrote a few years ago an article of uh, you should not use a splash screen, they are the devil, they are evil. They're very bad, but uh, they, they can be actually well done and they make sense in some cases. You can have an application that needs to download a lot of data from the cloud, needs to connect and synchronize, whatever. If you do it this way, that's great. This uh, uh, splash screen will keep the user engagement and is not really interrupting the, the, uh, the flow of working with your application. There are a few more techniques. If, uh, in general, if we are doing uh, calculations, we should do them on a worker street, nothing of, uh, of locking the, the UI while we are doing that. And uh, if you are having some problems with responsiveness, you have these two tools, the SysTrace and the trace view. How many people know them? Okay, for those who don't, I also recommend you, when you get home, check the, the ADV tools you have installed and play a little bit with SysTrace and trace view because they will definitely lever up your Android game. When we are developing as well, um, we Android provides us the DDMS. Does anybody know what it means exactly? Yeah. To be honest, I have to check it because I uh, don't remember it all the time, but it's Dalvik, the back monitor server, and um, it's actually this uh, screen over here. So if uh, you check it out, you have a few, uh, I guess everybody should be, if you are not aware of this screen, you should uh, definitely check it out. But you have a lot of tools here that can um, uh, help you to uh, debug um, your Android application. You can check the memory status. You can see the threads that are working. You can check the allocation of items. 
that's very good when you're having a, um, well, very, very frequently we have memory leaks, right? Especially if we are using reactive Java. How many people use reactive Java here? Okay, I don't know if uh, Marcus is here. I was talking with him yesterday. But uh, well, reactive Java is, a, is a something relatively new, right? And uh, it's, I, I don't think many people know exactly how to use it. And it, it can be dangerous because pretty much when we're using reactive, we're starting our, our um, uh, reactive uh, petitions. They go, they try to fetch some data, they came back and maybe our fragment is not there anymore or our activity is not there anymore. That means memory leaks. And by using this tool, we can actually go to the memory allocation and see exactly the memory that is being allocated and not used anymore. So DDMS is also one of your best friends here. Uh, when it comes uh, to networking, um, if uh, in combination with the DDMS, there is something very cool that we can, we can apply. And is uh, we can tag the threads. Uh, that means when we're, we have our own application, if we want to see exactly the consumption that this application is uh, having in terms of uh, internet connection and sockets open, etc., we can decide, okay, for this thread, I'm going to tag it. So I will be able later to debug and see exactly uh, how many petitions I'm doing. Let's imagine we do this thing and we came later to the DDMS. If we apply that technique, well, in this case, there is only one... Uh, um, one, uh, this is the total of uh, internet um, network connections we're having, but by tagging all our uh, threads, we will be able to have here a, a total amount of, uh, of the, the traffic separated and filtered by uh, threads, and we will be able to see it here. That can, sometimes can be very helpful, because in an application we will have different uh, networks requests, and some of them are doing some things, the other ones are requesting whatever, and it's hard to debug sometimes, because operations can be in background, by doing this, we can um, also be able to trace efficiently what we're doing. If you don't do that, I also recommend you. You should start tagging your threads every time you're developing. Another of the points I mentioned are layouts. Um, when we are watching the television, uh, we, have, um, uh, well, we have these two standards, NTSC, that's the American one, PAL, the European one. They work with 24 and 25 frames per second. Um, when we have the, those uh, cameras uh, that I can record in a slow motion, they are at least uh, 48 frames per, per second. Uh, but uh, still, blur can occur, if, uh, uh, in the, especially in the television uh, standards. And here it came the interesting part. I don't know if you guys have realized that applications, mobile applications, should be working with 60 frames per second, which means if you're performing a lot of computation, very likely, at some point, this will not be respected because you are uh, computing whatever data and this will be reflected on the, on the UI. It actually means, if you think about that, that every 60 milliseconds you need to update the screen. And well, there can be a lot of things that can cause this 60 uh, milliseconds deadline to not be respected if the hierarchy needs to be redrawn very, very frequently, etc. This is how a layout uh, hierarchy looks like. Can you think of a problem here? Anybody can see any problem on this structure? This is a standard, it's not something customized. Nothing? Well, that could be a problem depending on the design, but uh, the main problem is if we came here to the, uh, uh, to the top level, we see that we have a decor view. The decor view is the holder that Android uses to put everything inside. What's the problem? Generally, we also have our content, which means that we have the holder, we put something over the holder, and we have to render the holder on our own view. But we don't need the holder, we, we already have our screen. One thing we can do, and it will be an immediate improvement in your application, is to use this uh, thing here on your theme. You can set up the, windows, uh, the window background as null, and you will get rid of this holder. So that means there is one thing that you don't need to render all the time because you will have your own background that is over the, the screen. Also in Android we have a, a well we can do a few things to, uh, to improve how we are working with uh, hierarchies. Let's think of this very simple uh, layout. We have just an image view and a text view. It can be whatever that needs to be included in all the, all the different applications. If we use here this uh, include layout, we 
are able to take layers that have been previously created and uh, reduce them through the entire uh, layers. That's very helpful and it's a typical use case if we have a header, a footer, or this kind of content. But uh, still, it can be improved. Does anybody know uh, an improvement over the include uh, tab? That's very good. That's very right. So the problem with this include is that the, it will include that is it, as, as the, layer, the layout has been defined, which can also lead into a lot of nested hierarchies and uh, reducing layers that are not relevant anymore. But uh, if we do the merge, the merge tag will take care of merging the, the hierarchy that is not needed anymore. In general, merge should be used instead of uh, include. View staff. How many people know the view staff component? Okay. Well, view staff is a, is a class that can be added as a node inside a layout hierarchy, uh, specifying a lay layout reference, but it will not be drawn until the layout is inflated and uh, it needs to be done on runtime. So either with this viewstab.inflate or setting the visibility to true. If you haven't used it, the viewstab is, is, is great and it allows you also to uh, be able to reuse components and um, inflate components on real time as well. So pretty much uh, by calling the, well, this is actually not my favorite style. I think I made the presentation a long time ago, but uh, instead of doing this thing from here, I would use uh, Butter knife. Does anybody know here butter knife? Yeah. If you don't use it, pretty much butter knife um, uh, can, um, by using annotations, can take components that are on the uh, on the layout and inflate them on a very easy way. You get rid of all this uh, boilerplate code. You don't need to, you know, make the the view stuff at the beginning or or etc. And um, yeah, for if you are doing, um, you should know the hierarchy viewer as well. If you are an Android developer, as you've been in this business for for some time, with this uh, tool from here, we are able to see exactly the the layouts we have, the components we have. We are able to see as well that we have this holder, this nasty holder that you should get rid uh, of, etc. And it's very convenient, especially when we are working with components that are inflated on real time. Think of the list view or the recycler view of the view stuff if you're using them. It's very common, you're, you fetch the data from the internet and you don't know if in a recycler view you're going to have one or ten components. So the only efficient way to debug it is by using the hierarchy viewer. Also, when it comes to refreshing the screen, we have this developer mode enabled in, the, um, in uh, our Android devices. So we can, uh, we can activate this. Uh, I like this one particularly and is the, uh, we can profile the GPU rendering. So if we activate it, we have these bars this, uh, with a particular color code, and each color is specifying an, an operation that is happening on the, on the thread. Um, you probably know, guys, this, uh, you now, now have this uh, in Firebase, you have this test lab, or in Amazon you, have the, you can test the device on the cloud. Um, it's actually possible in most of those providers to activate this mode on the emulator, and when you're running all the tests, you can record the screen, with those colors and then you can take a look later. So you can say, okay, now I'm not only going to run my test, but I'm going to see if in all the devices this is happening, uh, is there any lag or um, the user experience is being affected? And by recording that, then later you can see, oh, look, at this time the, the blue color, which is the, the time you spend drawing the, each frame is taking a lot of time. I need to take care of uh, this particular Huawei device, uh, very odd, blah, blah, blah. The color is... Uh, Something like blue is to draw, represents the time that you need to draw the views. Purple is the time you spend to um, prepare and transfer to the rendering thread um, the, the frames. The red bar is the time spent to process OpenGL operations. And the orange bar is actually the time of execution. So if you can hear, you see that uh, orange is uh, generally the, the, the process that requires more time. Well. Another point in Android high performance is memory. Memory is the ability to remember information, experiences, and people. This is also a Cambridge definition. It seems that a machine right now maybe doesn't uh, remember a lot of experiences, but fingers crossed, maybe this will change. Have you guys known, I think I talked about that with the uh, Spanish Mafia yesterday, the, a book called Homo Deus. If you haven't read that, I totally recommend you that book. The, the guy is a, a Jewish uh, professor um, at the University of Tel Aviv and starts making a lot of uh, an, ex an exercise of imagination, how the machines will be in the future. And you know, in the future, we have those clocks that are able to see how 
uh, how your hair beat is. And if you're a man and you're speaking with, uh, let's say, Marie and Isabel, the, the clock or the computer will be able to say, okay, you have a better connection with this girl or this other one, and the, the computers will be able to feel all those things and to experience them. So I will post later in on Twitter the, the name of the book. Well, anyway, memory. We have uh, enumerations. Are enumerations good or are enumerations bad? Huh? Yeah. They require memory. Uh, but they are, maybe that's the paradigm with the uh, enumerations. They are easy to remember, right? Because it's it looks like uh, since that, you know, more, more or less human language, uh, we can see a shape and this shape has different categories. Well, enumerations in general, in general take more memory. I will now explain the process and how can we keep the good things of uh, enumerations and uh, still make them memory efficiently. So if we do this thing here, um, let's gonna just remember this thing. We have an enumeration called shape with different type of shapes. We could do this thing. We could create a public class with a lot of static uh, uh, variables that are integers. Each one of them is associated with an, an integer. And which one is more expensive from a memory perspective? So the answer to this question is twofold. Uh, actually, to do this, I, I created a, a big APK and uh, made a lot of enums, um, compiled it, then another one with a, an static class, compile it, decompile it, see exactly the, the size they were having, and, uh, and then checking the deck size that the, they were producing. And the problem with the example enumeration that I saw before is that uh, it's converted into four objects uh, with a string for the name and an integer for the value. Whereas, so it's like a wrapper class, whereas this integer is lighter because we just store the integer value. You could say, well, it doesn't matter a lot because you know, it will be a few more bytes, etc. As always, it depends. If your software can get really big and the hello world will always work, but we don't want to make the hello world work. We want to make software that scales efficiently. So uh, if... Um, we, for example, let's say, have this function that is going to um, calculate the surface. And if uh, we are using the, uh, the enumeration, we need to make something like this. We send the shape uh, as a parameter, depending on the ki kind of shape we will calculate the surface, for example. This is how it would like with the, uh, with the static classes. It's pretty much the same, just that we are sending an integer. Maybe the only problem is that the, the integer is not human readable because an integer can be one, two, three, four. We want to know exactly the uh, uh, deal with the, the values and enumeration. Well, here is how we can combine the best of both worlds. Who knows here the in-def annotation? Good. So in-def annotation is a very useful annotation provided by Android exactly to deal with those things. It's, it helps us to simplify the transition from uh, enumeration into integer values. So this is how we would use it. Uh, we will still define our static variables here, as I did before, rectangle, triangle, square, circle. But then I will use this in the annotation over a, a function that is called shape. And I will use it this way. When I want to return this value, or when I want to do this with this value, I will use the shape annotation and this makes everything more readable. It seems that we are thinking in terms of objects. If it seems that we're still dealing with uh, an object-oriented programming paradigm. So we are keeping the, the nice part of the enumerations, which is the readability. And on the other side, we're making them efficiently. So we are not uh, taking a lot of memory that is not uh, uh, required. In general, the enumerations should um, are unnecessary. They create unnecessary allocations. We should avoid using them and uh, use as much as possible the static final integer values with this in-def annotation. And, um, well, same uh, happens a little bit with constants, right? Because it's a uh, constant at the end is, uh, is uh, a static final variable, so they, uh, they generally help us to save a lot of uh, memory. Well, strings. Strings are good or are bad? Any strong opinion? <laughs> well, strings are, are strings. Uh, they are necessary, but um, they, they are also, mem in terms of memory, not very efficient because string objects are immutable. When you um, instantiate a, a string with a constructor, like in the upper part, 
the string example, it's, a, it's an object itself and the memory needs to be allocated. And then we are also calling the constructor. So in terms of uh, memory, the upper part is not super, super efficient. It would be better if we just uh, do it like in the down example, because we are not calling to the, uh, to the constructor. But this still can get better. Again, there is the, the, when I'm talking about this topic, people say like, ah, but it doesn't make a big difference if I'm using one constructor or the other. It can make a difference if you end up with a software that has millions of uh, code lines and you know you need to be recreating these objects all the time and updating threads. It can really make a difference. So let's think instead that uh, we are working with a string buffer. So a string buffer, if uh, how many people use or know a string buffer? Okay, I'm proud of you. Well, the string buffer it's, uh, it's more efficient than the string class because it works over character arrays. So for a better execution, we could um, use the string buffer as follows, and it will take less memory than uh, the previous method. We will, uh, um, um, yeah, well, an another thing to keep in mind is that the, the string buffer uh, have initial capacity of 16 characters, and any time we need to increase it, if we need to append more, uh, more information, it will double the capacity. So that means from 16 into 32 into 64, 128. But we can also make this more efficient. If we have a glab, uh, an idea of how much information do we need to uh, actually store on the string buffer, we can call the constructor with this number, 64, because we know we are going to store about 64 characters, and this will make the, the string uh, uh, buffer much more efficient. Memory leaks. Memory leaks are defined as uh, well, a type of resource leak that occurs when a computer program is incorrectly managing memory allocations in a way that the memory stays there when it's not required anymore. That's the Wikipedia definition. I didn't find one in uh, Cambridge. If you use Reactive Java, uh, it's uh, uh, probably something you have deal with very frequently when a memory leak uh, happens. Let's see how memory leaks uh, occur. Can anybody see a problem in this little piece of code? Static, that's right. So pretty much we have this static view that will keep the, the reference alive all the time and no matter if the activity is there or, or not, the, the view will, will keep uh, taking a space in memory. In general, if you're working with uh, static values, it's something you have to think one and two and three times and before doing that. Even if you think it doesn't matter, it does matter. Recently, I, I consult, so I see a lot of code from different companies, and I was working with a, a company that did something similar. They made an static map that was in an activity, and you say, well, the map is, well, you know, memory, a memory leak can happen, but it's not that terrible. Well, it happened that uh, the map was in the main screen, so they were like going to an option, and when they were clicking back, coming back to the map. And uh, after, 10 minutes using the application, the application had like 200 megabytes in RAM because they were not uh, using this efficiently. So it's something you need to test thoroughly and intensively and see that nothing is happening. That's actually the problem. If we see the constructor of the views, this is what happened. We send the context, and uh, if we're sending the static context, it will always keep the place in memory. So uh, one of the things we can, uh, uh, well, um, this is uh, another problem. Can anybody think of problem with uh, non-static inner classes? That's exactly what happens. Uh, so this is something that many people use, and um, I think it was a standard practice, even in the official documentation of Android. If you go to see the, the well, I don't know if anybody uses Asintas, right? Because we're in 2016. But um, if you go to the official documentation, they have an example using the Asintas as a private class in the Google documentation, which is like, you don't do any code reviews to make the documentation. This is terrible. Well, we can help or uh, do this a little bit better if we use weak references. Does anybody here is familiar with the weak references and phantom references? I was, uh, two weeks ago, I was in another conference here in Poland, and one guy from the Spanish Mafia said something like, uh, uh, if you are an Android developer and you don't know weak reference, you have a problem. And I think it's true, because not many people use weak references. I don't see that very often, but it's definitely something that will improve the quality of your code from the moment you start understanding them and using them. Pretty much a weak reference will make the variable disappear at the time it's not uh, 
bin reference. So if we see here this code, uh, exactly, we see that we are defining uh, the weak reference there. So at the moment, uh, this uh, async task is not, uh, is not being uh, referenced anymore. It doesn't matter why or if we have changed the activity or whatever. It will be removed from the, from the memory. So another tip, if you don't know weak references and phantom references, when this talk finishes and you have some time, go Google about them and check them out. Well, threading was another of the points I mentioned. Threading is a method of hair removal originating in Asia. That's a Wikipedia definition, but it's probably not very relevant for us. Well, there is another ref uh, definition. A threading is the smallest sequence of program instructions that can be managed independently by a scheduler. That's also Wikipedia definition. We have a few items that we can use. Android provides us the async task, the loaders, uh, different threads. In general, there are many strategies. I think here applies that you need to know your word. You need to know what do you want to do. You need to know what's the functionality. And then choose one of the um, components that Android is providing. The asyntas communicates the, it's the, the very standard um, component to, net, uh, to make uh, threading operations. It communicates the worker thread with the UI. The typical example or the example in the Google documentation is to download some PDF, I think, or making some request and then updating the UI. It's uh, something a little bit old. It made sense when Android, the Android ecosystem was starting in general. Um, but it, it's uh, subject to a lot of misuse. Not many people uh, use them efficiently. In general, if you do not need to communicate with the UI, and you do not need to notify the user, you do not need an asymptote. So keep that in mind. Sometimes people just use them to make a background operation without notifying anything to the UI. You don't need an asymptote for that. And um, yeah, some many people, and very often in many libraries, you see that the, the async task is uh, calling, you, you have to parameter, uh, send the, uh, the parameters, uh, these three parameters, and many people just send all the parameters as void. But that means you're only integrating the doing background. And in that case, if all your parameters are void, think about that, because you don't need an async task. Async task loader. Does anybody know the async task loader? OK. Well, it's used to fetch data. It has the same uh, features as an async task, but uh, it has a very nice feature, which makes it, uh, under my eyes, uh, generally a little bit better and more appropriate. And is that it's, uh, in, it's uh, independent from the activity lifecycle. Um, so you don't need to connect it with uh, the demon, the, the evil of the life cycle activity. This is how it would, lo it would look. And um, well, in general, uh, you see that you get one result. You need to operate with it and then can implement those methods, um, loading background, etc. We have services. Services are not threads. And um, something that is also surprising is that uh, the services run by default in the UI. Many people think they are, because service sounds like background, or we tend to connect these notions, but they're actually like running in the UI thread. We need to specify that uh, if we want them to run somewhere else. They should never uh, be used to start a long running operation, and they have their own life cycle that we need, we need to handle. Intent services. How many people know intent services? That's good. Well, it's a particular implementation of a service. They execute the operation sequentially on the background. And uh, another good thing is that we don't need to handle the life cycle. So as, a, as programmers, we need to write as less code as possible and handle as less things as possible. The best code to maintain is the code that doesn't exist. So if we get rid of the life cycle, that's always a plus. Networking. Networking is the process of communicating between different terminal nodes to exchange data. That's my definition because I didn't find one in Wikipedia. Well, we have a, a lot of techniques that are actually not uh, applied by, by default in, uh, in Android, but that uh, can make our, our library easy. I always thought, that, wow, somebody needs to write an open source library that uh, does uh, all those techniques. One of them would be the latency gouging. So this looks something similar to this. Sometimes, depending on the network connection we have, we want to, well, let's say, we want to download images. That will take a, a, a lot of uh, a network bandwidth, or we need to, I don't know, whatever, do, do uh, intense operations. 
if you see this piece of code here, we are checking if the, the Wi-Fi is connected uh, or if the mobile is connected. And in the case of the mobile, we can see if we're connected with LTE, GPRS, we have different parameters. Well, this is something that doesn't take that much effort to apply. And we could say, well, depending on what I want to do, I will apply one of those policies. So if, the, if I'm connected on Wi-Fi, let's say, I will try to synchronize all the media resources because they will take a lot of time. But if not, I will just wait until it's done. It's connected and then I can uh, apply this kind of um, uh, policies. Batch connections. Um, this, uh, is, um, uh, this is, is uh, it's actually used by a lot of analytics. We can anal analytics, for example, does it. And it means that we wait, we collect the data, and then we send everything at once. This has one advantage. When we want to open a connection, we actually need to uh, you know, open the socket, send all the information, close the connection, and that takes a lot of impact on battery and bandwidth as well. Sometimes it's not required because the information doesn't need to be sent immediately. If we apply this policy, we will uh, make the software more efficient. The, the battery will last longer. That means at the end, like better use uh, reviews and better use experience, etc. It's something as, as happens with the threads, you need to know exactly which scenario are you dealing with and apply the, the policy that fits you better. We can also prefetch information. So prefetching information is, uh, means that we will download as much as possible when the user is idle. Let's say we are in a, in a screen where the user is just reading the news, for example, is not performing any operation or uh, doing whatever, and we can at this time, if we know that the possible next scenarios are, okay, the user now needs to, will need to download this information, maybe if he goes to this screen or to the other one, we can be smarter and start prefetching that, that information. So when the user actually clicks, we don't need to make the request at that time, but it has been downloaded previously. Also, and well, this, uh, as well, this uh, uh, technique from here will, uh, as you can imagine, uh, well, will we'll make everything more efficient. We can queue the connections. That, uh, that means uh, it's a particular case to um, reduce the amount of uh, times that we turn on and off the radio. And uh, we can do it uh, with, well, this is a very basic uh, example and a very basic implementation. I don't know how I did it because it seems that it's not compiling. But, uh, well, let's, let's think of uh, the same case. We need to perform a few requests so we can just create our own queue. We can pull everything there and at some point when we reach a size or uh, of, I don't know, whatever amount of requests, we can start all of them and we will save actually a lot of battery. And again, if you think this, uh, many people would say, well, but this doesn't make a big difference. That's the thing that I always heard uh, when talking about those topics. If you think so, try to make the implementation by yourself and then check it with DDMS exactly how much uh, requests you're doing and you know you can make numbers of how much battery you're gonna consume. And I can tell you that it's gonna break some of your assumptions. It definitely matters. A, base, a classic one, catching the response is sometimes we don't need to make the request all the time. So if uh, we know the information is going to be very similar, we can uh, uh, apply some caching. Uh, if we use, uh, you guys know uh, retrofit? How many people use this retrofit here? Okay, so retrofit provides a very easy example for um, catching uh, everything. It's uh, very easy to activate or Picasso for uh, images. And uh, that, that will save a lot of uh, uh, battery and uh, bandwidth on your device. Last modified. Um, also, uh, data doesn't get modified very often, so we can play it with this uh, header. We, of course, need to talk with the backend guys, you know, those guys that are working in a cellar without a lot of light and we send them emails. So, but it's, it's something that um, it can be very useful if uh, the, the backend can communicate with you and tells you, okay, this hasn't been modified in, I don't know, one month, so you don't need to download all the data, just get the version you had previously cast and so it. And um, we have as well the... Um, Exponential back off. The exponential back off, if uh, you remember from the university, uh, everybody studies in, in algorithms, pretty much tries uh, with uh, something similar to a more or less Fibonacci sequence or exponential sequence to uh, make the, the request uh, first after, let's say, one second, two seconds, four seconds, etc. Because there is one uh, special assumption here. If we are, we're getting a 404, it's very likely that the 404 will keep happening. You know, if there is a 500, then we don't need to stress the server if very likely we will not get something positive from there. So 
applying a technique like this will also make uh, the software more more efficient. Well, it's uh, there are a lot of things to talk about uh, Android high performance, but uh, the talk only has a, a limited amount of time. I'm always available in Twitter. Feel free to write me or I'll, after the talk also if you want to have any comment. I love to have feedback from people because that helps me also to prepare presentation better and and uh, will offer content that is more interesting. So if you go to this address and leave me your honest feedback, what you like, what you didn't like, I will send you a free copy of my uh, one of my books, 100 Questions and Answers, to get your Android um, dream job. I actually started writing. I was working for a company, and I used to make interviews to the candidates. So I was uh, I had like a huge Excel with uh, questions and and, and uh, how people was answering to them. And then I quit that job, so I needed to find a job. And then I decided, well, it would be a good idea to write a book about that. And uh, yeah, I think it's great. Uh, and and summarize is very, you can read it in a couple of hours and summarize is everything. So send me your feedback. You will get a copy of the book. And well, that's been uh, everything. Thanks a lot for being here and being so enthusiastic. And if you have any questions, I would be more than glad to answer them. Any questions? I have a question regarding enums. Uh, enums have a one uh, functionality. Mm, you can add a method to them and uh, each... You can add methods to what, sorry? To enums. Enums. And each instance can override it implement a different uh, behavior and what you would suggest to use instead? Uh, you mean when you have an enum and for example you have the constructor and then you uh, have the get enum based on the integer or based on the string? Uh, I mean if you who would uh, use intdef instead. Hmm. In general yes, when you use intdef you're using the, the final static uh, variables that always compile in an integer. So it's only that one. When you're using enums, you have this double compilation. As I said, it, it doesn't, if, if you use it once, it's not going to be any problem, but they take more space in memory, something that you have to keep in mind. My perception is that you should, from the beginning, try to do the software, as I, I think it says, like, uh, you should always program as if another person that is a psychopath and knows where you live is going to take over your code. So if in the future, you know, if you keep on doing that, you might have a problem. So Right now, I avoid enums at all costs. I use indef because you get the best thing of both worlds. You have the efficiency and you also have the readability. Uh, sorry, could you believe the last slide uh, back because I'd like to make a picture. Thanks. <laughs> mm, my ask is what about database? and? What uh, database is the most per performance? Mm. Database, ORM mechanism, you mean? Uh, for uh, local storage. Mm. Well, uh, I don't know if Marcus is here. I was, uh, I saw him yesterday, but uh, you, you have like different alternatives. I, I like GreenDAO, because it's, uh, GreenDAO is, uh, I think it's probably the fastest one in terms of benchmarking. Now, um, GreenDAO requires you to create another project to uh, create all those uh, objects and, uh, and everything. So in that sense, it's maybe not that readable. Depends on the project. I'm, I combine GreenDAO for efficiency and Realm for readability. Realm also is, is a company that has a lot of people backing it up and working on that. Depends always on the war you, you're battling. For me, those are the two more interesting. You have a lot of them. You have Sugar ORM. Uh, uh, after a few years, those are the two ones I, I keep an eye and I, I alternate them depending on the project. Any more questions? Well, if no more questions, you both guys get uh, one of those, so you can come and pick it up. Well, thank you, and uh, yeah, just uh, if you need anything, just uh, catch me up anytime after the talk. <laughs>